already found out at morning tea. But um, Associate Professor Stephen Hall has come to speak about uh, clinical trials, updates in latest uh, treatments, and um, he's a very well-known rheumatologist who I'm sure Stephen will, will take your questions and answers. Yeah. <laughs> I've been married a long time, I just do what I'm told. <laughs> I started doing rheumatology in about 1979, and we have come an unbelievable long way. <clears throat> in 1979, the best you could say about us was that a rheumatologist was a good friend. That was about it. And we used to have a surgeon sitting in every clinic. And we'd be going, surgery, 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 surgery. It was just a weekly thing that you would send maybe 5 to 10% of the visit people who visited that clinic after surgery. Then you'd be listed for surgery. And we had gold injections, penicillin, imuran, plaquenil. That's about it. And we had a lot of cortisone injections, and we had a lot of oral cortisone and we go to different anti-inflammatories, and we thought it was a real cool thing to got a new anti-inflammatory. That was a real cool thing. And the world changed. We learnt a number of things along the way. We didn't learn the cause, and we don't have the cure. So the two questions that you really need to have answered, what gave it to me, what's going to get rid of it? It's, in reality, we can't tell I think we need to be upfront about that, about what we can and can't do. <coughs> and those of you who know me know that it doesn't get much more upfront than this. But along the way, we know a lot of bad stuff. And I think it's really important that everybody knows the bad stuff. <coughs> because when you get recommended a treatment, you weigh up the risks and the benefits. I often think that people... You know, in a time of economic crisis, it's worth drawing the analogy. I often think that people in a consulting room <coughs> thank you, uh, fall into two groups. There is the person who's come for advice, the consumer, who's an investor. You'd like a return on your money. You'd like to be a bit better, but you don't want to lose your capital. You want to risk a side effect. <coughs> And there's the person who's offering the advice who's much more like a speculator. They want a big return. And they're prepared to live with some temporary loss. Because unlike the person who's coming for their advice, who's living this for the first time, they could be like me and seeing rheumatoid arthritis or something similar to that for the 6,000th time. <coughs> and after a while, you've seen it all. And you look at the things in a different way from the two sides of the desk. It's important, and we, and we tend to pussyfoot around. When I remember in the early to mid-1980s, people published articles which questioned whether we had any treatment that could prevent damage in rheumatoid arthritis. We had no idea whether we could prevent damage. And then people did the appropriate research studies which showed that you could prevent damage. Our difficulty in doing the trials at that point was you took people who had rheumatoid arthritis for an average of 15 years, who'd had a lot of damage, and then you did a trial for three months, and you tried to see a difference between the people who were on the drug and the people who were on the drug, and you had buckets. And it wasn't until we started doing trials on people who had very early rheumatoid, before they were getting damage, and then we could produce a drug and we could see that one group who were on real drug, on the active drug, had a dramatic difference compared to the others. What we do know is that lots of drugs will dramatically improve your quality of life. So the first thing was to show that we could actually make people feel a bit better. The second thing was to show that we could prevent damage. And that was the third thing. The third thing that we have is the thing that we haven't been as upfront with as we might. Is what we know is that rheumatoid arthritis does more than affect your arthritis. Rheumatoid
rheumatoid arthritis is associated with a dramatic increase in risk of heart attacks and strokes and diabetes. And we know that the life expectancy of people with rheumatoid arthritis compared to the population at large is substantially reduced. And we thought that really that's part of the arthritis, so we better not tell people that because they'll just get more depressed. That's what, because what I was told, I mean, in the early days, and we have Rod Strang's name outside, and he was the first seriously trained rheumatologist in this town. And I knew Rod, and he was an older man. But Rod used to tell people with rheumatoid arthritis in a way that I'm sure he thought was reassuring. You won't die from it, but you'll die with it. I didn't find that reassuring. <laughs> when I started my rheumatology training, which was in the United States, the oldest me member of our department of rheumatology, and we had 26 rheumatologists full-time in our department of rheumatology, so it was a big department. And the oldest person had been the youngest person in the team that introduced cortisone into medicine. Howard Polly had been the youngest person. And Howard introduced me to a person I was about. I guess I was in my late 20s. And Howard called me and he said, Steve, I've got something really interesting to show you. So I came in and there was a woman at my age, in my late 20s. And she obviously had room to her friends. So this is Dr. Hawke, he's from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I said hello and she said hello and then she complimented me for speaking English so well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, Dr. Polly, what do I have? What's, what's my problem? He said, you have rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, he said, what should I do? You should rest. Mm. What do you mean by rest? You should be in bed 22 hours a day. You can get up to go to the bathroom, have your meals and do your exercise. And how long should I do that? <coughs> you do that and come back and see me in a year. But Dr. Polly, I've got family, I've got, I've got children, I've got a job, I've got obligations. Turned to me. As far as how it was, was concerned, the consultation was over. I said, some people just don't want to get there. <laughs> I knew what I didn't want to be like. Then it turned out that we found that if you gave people methotrexate, and most people with rheumatoid arthritis of any severity are on methotrexate, if you gave people methotrexate, you dramatically improved their life expectancy. They lived longer. They had a 70% reduction in their risk of heart attacks. So it became quite clear that the risk of heart attack and the risk of reduction in life expectancy had nothing to do with the disease. It had everything to do with maintained inflammation. The chemicals that were being released with this inflammation were causing damage to blood vessels. And then we found that with methotrexate, you start to see a big change in what was happening with people with arthritis. And many people here have got rheumatoid, you know, all of you are youngish, young. So most people here have rheumatoid began in the last five years. Eight years, ten years? Twenty. Twenty-eight years. Twenty-one. If we look at people whose rheumatoid began in 1986, as opposed to before 1986, so that's the methotrexate era, the not methotrexate era, what we find is that the rate of orthopedic surgery <coughs> in the people who developed it later was down 60 to 70 percent. And complications that we used to see all the time when I was training in the early 80s and late 70s, like blood vessel inflammation, lung disease, shocking eye complications, we don't see that at all. Disappeared, gone, nada, bupkis, pretty much. I used to see rheumatoid vasculitis, really, I would see the case every three weeks. Terrible leg ulcers, people destroying their nerves, <coughs> terrible things. In the last 10 years, I think I've had two cases. And it's extraordinarily rare. Lung disease, you just have it all the time, very rare now. And the only lung disease I see now is the stuff that we used to think was rare. <coughs> so then we found in the mid in the late 1980s, 
people found that a chemical inside a joint of animals with arthritis and in rheumatoid patients with rheumatoid arthritis called tumor necrosis factor was in enormous amounts that just where the thickened lining of the joint met the cartilage. And that's where you get your first damage. So the idea was maybe that chemical's really important. And a boy from Elwood High, who's no longer Elwood High, who's a professor of immunology in London, Mark Feldman, and his colleagues developed the first anti-TNF therapy. And it worked in animals. And then we didn't hear about it for years because it turned out there were problems with production. And then the first of them came. And we had infliximab, and we had Tanacept, Enril, and then we got Humira. And these drugs, when you gave them, they stopped all damage in its tracks. It's not like it reduced the rate, stopped. And people were really nervous because these were the new drugs. And rheumatologists are specifically chosen because we're by nature timid. <laughs> we're really timid, scared creatures. And we get anxious about side effects. And so we... But once you use these drugs, you realise that for people who are on them, the world changes. You reckon? Yeah, it changes. Change your life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other people here I know, it's changed their lives. Some people doesn't work so well for. What does that tell us? It tells us that probably rheumatoid is not all the same. It probably tells us that in some people, tumor necrosis factor is the main chemical. But in other people, it may be another chemical called IL-6. And we have a drug, tocilizumab, which has been used in trials, which works very well for people who have not responded to, to anti-TNF therapies. <clears throat> there are other drugs that will work on different chemicals. And so the pharmaceutical industry has been passionately involved in trying to identify. Do they do this out of the goodness of their heart? No. <laughs> they do it to make a buck. <clears throat> but that's okay. Do you like cheese? Does anybody like craft cheese slices? Nobody eats craft cheese slices? Anybody like camembert? Yeah. Do they make it out of the bottom? Do the, do the people who make camembert do it as a social service. <laughs> they do it to make money, to live. Remarkably, that's what we have to do. But sometimes our needs and their needs can be congruent. We can move together. People have ever had antibiotics in this room? Anybody who's never had an antibiotic in their life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Liar. laughs> Is there anybody in the room who's never had an antibiotic? Never had a prescription for antibiotics ever in their life? No. Is there'll be people in the room who are on the pill. Do you think that, you're, that these things were released without there being trials in patients to see if they were safe and effective? For every medicine you've ever taken, someone before you has been involved in the process of trialling it. In a sense, being involved in the process of clinical trials goes beyond something in it for you. There is almost a social obligation. And people get involved in clinical trials out of two reasons. <clears throat> One is an exercise in altruism, which is, I've got a really crummy condition, and I'm going to do whatever I can do to make it better. And one of the very positive ways you can make it better is to be involved in clinical trials, to put your hand up and say, yep, I'll be involved in this process. The other is, because there's something in it for you. If you choose your trial carefully, and that does involve talking to the people running the trial, you can do both. You can find there's something really good in it for you. And there are people in this room I know who've been involved in clinical trials, and they have to really change their life. Has anybody here been involved in clinical trials? Yeah. Now, I have to say that I probably do a lot of clinical trials. And we do clinical trials in all sorts of things. Because when you deal with rheumatic diseases, you're dealing with areas of need. But we've got trials, we've got these three anti-TNS, and those of us who are involved with rheumatology think they're terrific. But it turns out that about 50% of people who are on them get excellent clinical responses to the point where we know they're not going to, we, we know they're perfect. 50% get 
probably about another 30% get terrific responses, but they're still going to be not perfect. There's going to be some progression damage. And about 20% of people genuinely don't get enough of a response to justify the drug. And then we've got to look for other things. And we know with all of our drugs, after a while, the beast that is arthritis can become resistant to the drug. And stuff that used to be poison for the arthritis, they now chew it up and spit it out like rabbits that have got mixed up. Right? They, become, they become resistant to myxomatosis. And so we have all sorts of things. We know that osteoarthritis has been a disease where we have not been able to interfere with the quality of people's lives. We've not been able to stop it progressing. But we're involved now in a whole series of studies trying to see if we can stop that progressing. We know that people with fibromyalgia have had very little to offer. And we're now trialling a variety of drugs which really are showing great promise in terms of being able to improve their quality of life. <coughs> Lupus has been a very difficult disease to treat. And we've found a whole series of things that might be helpful. And there have been a number of clinical trials of different agents for the treatment of lupus. It's fair to say that for many of those trials, they've been directed at the most severe problems with lupus, like kidney disease, which don't tend to be things that fall into the province of rheumatologists. Once they get bad kidney disease, we flip them off to the kidney specialists because people with lupus may well go on to kidney failure. And you want the people who prepare them for kidney failure to be the ones involved in the care. We know that people with spondylitis, which is a real common problem, and spondylitis and conditions related to it, like psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, the arthritis we see with bowel inflammation, those diseases have responded dramatically to anti tumor therapies. Quite stunningly. It used to be the most miserable thing. You diagnose somebody with ankylosing spondylitis. You've got ankylosing spondylitis here, take the anti inflammatory tablets, do your exercises, not much more we can do for you. See you later. Now you can tell them, you know, we used to say that, but these TNF therapies are terrific. And they probably help about 70% of people. But we're looking for other stuff. And there are other candidate compounds that are looking very good in that regard. We have antibodies to other things, which we call interleukins, which are chemicals. And, there's, and because doctors are really interesting people, with all that imagination that characterises doctors. You know, so doctors now grew up in the play school generation, you know, B1 and B2. So we give everything numbers. There's interleukin 1, interleukin 2. <laughs> now we're up to interleukin 17. Okay. And we know that there are drugs that are anti-IL-17s. There are anti-IL-12s and anti-IL-23s, which are looking good. Anti-IL-15 has been trialled. Anti-IL-11 didn't look so good. You never know whether the drug's going to work until you trial it out. You firstly trial it in experimental animals. And if it shows promise in an animal model of arthritis, then you might move over to humans. Then the next step is you give it to normal people who've got nothing wrong with them. My only son used to make money out of that. Because normal people, there's nothing in it for them. So they get paid for their studies. They get dollars. So my son used to do these studies. I used to tell him, you know, when you're in the shower, just check, make sure there's all the, all the right equipment's there and the right numbers. <laughs> But you can do that, and we'll be trialling a new antibody for rheumatoid arthritis, both in normal people and in people with rheumatoid arthritis. People have no disease, and before, and when, if it looks like it's okay in that group, then we're going to trial it through some preliminary trials as single infusions in people with rheumatoid arthritis, and that'll be coming up next year. We have Australian-designed compounds. And there's one, there's a trial going on with a compound called CPN10, or XTOL. And this is one which we've already trialled and published on. And it shows great promise at being quite stunningly effective. And this is different to the anti-TNF, because the anti-TNFs block the activity of TNF. This doesn't quite do that. And this is like turning down the volume control, not only on TNF, but on a number of other chemicals. So we keep enough there, hopefully, to do what ever God intended for the TNF to do, and we damn it, we dampen it down, and we hope that that will make a difference. We won't know, but it's an Australian compound that's been trialled in Australia, and we're all very positive about what it can do. And for those of you who've not been involved in a clinical trial, I can tell you one thing, you've never been looked after better in your life <laughs> than if you're in a clinical trial, because 
Fortunately, you can get rid of the doctor most of the time. Really good news, that is. Because we have the nurse who keeps an eye on you. So you tend to see the nurse for about an hour at a time, each time that you come in. And you tend to sit, have lots of time to sit and chat, and then the doctor will come and see you. And so by that stage, you've told them every possible thing that can happen. And these nurses are real smart. And they're really experienced, and they've seen lots of people with arthritis. So when something's out of the ordinary, they pick it up. And so you get looked after extraordinarily well. Hard to imagine somebody being neglected in a clinical trial. It's really, the only problem with it is it's time consuming to be involved. You might have to assign an hour, maybe two hours a month to being involved. And people say, well, my time is at a premium. I don't have that time, that's understandable. But you are really looked after very well in the trial. And once you enter that trial, the first thing, the, the, the fundamental principle of the trial is that the first priority of the trial is to look after the patient's welfare. Keeping them on the trial is not the issue. It's to look after their welfare. So you get looked after incredibly well. And as I said, I do lots of trial work and I see lots of people in different clinical trials. And, and I, I have to say that uh, it becomes a different relationship because it's, it's no longer the doctor-patient relationship. You become far more part of the team. You have a personal investment in what's going on in that exercise. And it's been able to change them. So it's, it's really a very exciting time. Very exciting time to be a rheumatologist. Very exciting time to have been involved in this type of research activity. I have to tell you, get rheumatoid arthritis now. It's a hell of a lot better than getting it 25 years ago. Because your outlook's going to be a whole heap better. The hard part is to make that transition to being prepared to accept medication. That's the hard part. And you need to be a little bit pushy, a little bit assertive about saying what you want. Because I'm here to tell you that what you can aspire to, we used to say that to people with rheumatoid arthritis, well, you're unlikely to be working in three years' time. That was the truth. Most people who developed rheumatoid arthritis were not working three years after diagnosis. Now, I would tell somebody with new onset rheumatoid arthritis, you should be able to continue playing competitive sport for as long as you want to. Continue doing whatever you want to do as long as you want to do it. We've got the toys now to play with to allow that to happen. And we're going to have better toys in the next five to ten years. We've got drugs coming up. And if your doctors have ever shown you x-rays which show little holes being hidden out of your bones to point out why the damage is being done, there's a new drug that's, been, that's coming up that will heal those holes. They'll make them regrow. They'll make them regrow. And we're going to be playing with some incredible stuff. I've got a question about clinical trials. Generally, have they on the track today? No, not necessarily. Because most of the time, I've been knocked back in clinical trials because mm -hmm. I can't tolerate the yeah, not necessarily. Uh, we've got a clinical trial. Uh, see, one of our problems is, is expense. The drugs that, that we've got now, these biological drugs, are bloody expensive. The, the mechanism by which they're made, these large molecules, that they're made by living cells in large mats that look like wheat silos. And they're insanely expensive to manufacture. And the cost of the community is about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year. Might not have occurred to any of you, but we're looking down the barrel of some financial trouble around the world. It <laughs> hasn't been advertised much, but it's out there. <laughs> and it really is going to be questionable as to whether the world can afford it. Yeah. So we're looking at, increasingly, with greater interest, to things that are affordable, what we call small molecules. Small molecules are what you've had all the time. Penicillin, anti-inflammatory drugs, cortisone, um, the pill. They're all small molecules made in factories, not made by living organisms. The ones that are made by living organisms we call biological compounds. They're made by a living thing. Chinese hamster ovaries cells in culture. I reckon the worst thing that can happen to you is you're born. They say you're a Chinese hamster and you're a girl. You know, you're in trouble. You know what's going to happen. <laughs> but we're looking at small molecules and a number of the trials now recognise what you're talking about. But the real world experience, one of our problems about doing clinical trials is that they try to make everything too refined and too yeah. narrow. Criteria. Yeah. We have a Cochrane collaboration. She's, she's left, unfortunately. Uh, Sophie's gone, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. The Cochrane collaboration, as you've heard, have you talked about the Cochrane collaboration? It's, it's the world 
way of pooling evidence-based medicine. And it's the way we they pool all the data. The problem with that is that it turns out that if you're doing trials in people with rheumatoid arthritis, <coughs> only 10% of your patients are ever eligible for a trial. Mm-hmm. And then we get the drug and then we apply it to the other 90% for whom it wasn't eligible. Not exactly evidence-based. Mm-hmm. You've got to jump from the evidence. Mm-hmm. And that's a little bit crazy. So now the regulators are accepting this, and so now they're, they're adding an arm to most of the trials which says, we'll add this drug to whatever you're taking. And so we look for trials like that for whatever people are taking. So we have trials for people who've never been on methotrexate. We've got trials for people who've been on methotrexate and are not doing well. We've got trials which are long-term, trials which try to take people with milder disease, not terrible disease, and see whether you can put them on a biological drug for a period of time, and then take them off and see if the benefits will be maintained, or whether you can get by using smaller amounts of the drug, which hasn't been trialled before. We've got drugs that have never been used, and we're going to see studies of ways to use what we have in a more efficient and better way. But there will be trials available, and there will be trials coming up in the near future for someone who hasn't been on methotrexate or has been on methotrexate, can't tolerate it, or just doesn't want to be on methotrexate. Lots of people don't want to be on this trip. You know, who, what don't you do in a trial? Well, you know, one of the things you don't do in a trial is don't get pregnant mm-hmm. on the trial drug. You don't know where they're safe. But if you're on methotrexate, you're not getting pregnant on that either. And if you're on a rabbit, you're definitely not getting pregnant on that. Because that, that does cause terrible abnormalities in unborn children. Well, even in animals it does. We're not going to take the risk with humans. But there's there's restrictions on, you're right, what you're talking about, there are restrictions in the interests of your safety. But hopefully we make the restrictions less in terms of allowing more people to be eligible to be part of the process. But the same concerns about your safety will still be there. I'm open for questions, kids. Okay. Um, so without sounding like I'm a person that hasn't um, heard much about clinical trials before, so there are lots of benefits, like you were saying, but what about the not so great sides of it? Can you think of mm. examples of sure. bad effects on people who have been in clinical trials? Uh, Atrophy effect? <laughs> pardon? I'm curious. To okay. Know, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There, there was a famous clinical trial, not done with patients, done with, in that phase one, okay. normal volunteers. Normal volunteers, not really. Non-sistic. Male students. <laughs> backpackers. <laughs> yeah, that's, where, that's, where, that's where most of the phase one studies are done. Right? Normal backpackers <laughs> who are travelling through because they want to pick up 3,000 bucks and they can do it by uh, living in at the, the hospital for four days and getting an infusion. And so there was a famous study in England where they gave eight people simultaneously a drug that had never been given to humans before. And six of them were on the real drug and two of them were on the placebo. And the six were on the real drug within 15, 30 minutes were writhing in agony. And it caused something that they'd not seen in animals. And they were stupid because they gave it simultaneously, which is crazy. You should have given it once and you would have known. And then the others wouldn't have got it. So there's always that. That's in the phase one studies. Um, I wouldn't do a phase one study on a patient unless I had some basic human data first. So that's not what I do. Yeah. So, okay. So, but we and and so I, I wouldn't be doing it that. I think it depends on what you do. There are three phases of clinical trials. There's phase one, which is normal volunteers or people who are just going to get one or two doses to get an idea of how long it lasts in the system. Then there will be phase two, which we call proof of concept. In other words, we might give it to 80 people, 20 of whom get a fake drug and then 20 get it in a small dose, 20 in a medium dose, 20 in a higher dose. And we try and get an idea about whether it's showing a signal that it's working, as we think it should. And then we will go on to a phase three study, which will typically be about 1,000 patients. And you've got lots of human data from the experience from the previous studies to suggest that that would be safe and effective. By the time you get to phase three, the most unusual to get any serious problems with any frequency. They've already been wiped out. But it's fair to say that many of the drugs that we work on for rheumatoid arthritis have their own side effects, whether they're in a clinical trial or not. We know that the more powerfully you suppress the body's immune system, the more at risk of infection you might be. 
and it becomes weighing up the risks and the benefits. If you, what you have is, you know, one tiny little finger on the, the ring, ring finger and you've got a little bit of swelling there, you wouldn't go to the clinical trial. You'd be out of your mind. I'd never suggest to a patient that they do that. They don't have enough problems to bother with. But somebody who is having trouble getting up out of bed in the morning, sits down on the couch in the evening to watch TV and has trouble getting up, whose energy level's poor, who's had to cut back on their life activities, and particularly anybody who's arthritis has shown any tendency to get damaged, they should be on more aggressive treatment. And whether they get aggressive treatment in the context of normal activity, normal but currently available drugs on our subsidised system, or whether they are interested or require something beyond that. Because the government puts great restrictions on who can get the TNF units. You know, if, if you're playing it by the rules as a doctor, and we are encouraged to play it by the rules, it's extraordinarily difficult to get people on. We've only ever had 4,000 people in this country, ever, be on TNF units and biological drugs. Really? Yeah. Doctor, all these hooks have blood tests and lung x-rays oh, yeah. so many joints, so long, so many disease modifiers. You've got to go on all this other stuff, you know. I look at bills and I say, now, has anybody here been on a rubber? And I say, now, let me tell you about a rubber. And he goes through all the side effects and I say, and then there's a good and a bad. And the bad side effect is that you've got a 1-2% to chance of losing hair. And for obvious reasons, I'm not very sensitive. <laughs> when it comes in she says I'm losing here I say thank you that's flattering <laughs> me, I think that's really flattering and they say no I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to be honest and then I say and you've got about 35% chance that you could lose some weight bring it on <laughs> bring it on there's no such thing as too skinny and so it's, it's an interesting thing so, so you know but we, do have, we do have these extraordinary restrictions it's fair to say that for anybody with serious arthritis most of us would say methotrexate is the best single oral medication that we have. And it stood the test of time. We've been using it now for, since 1950 for various things. We've been using it for rheumatoid arthritis solidly since 1980. And that's what we're pushing 30 years. No surprises. Works extraordinarily well. Don't get any liver problems unless you drink a hell of a lot. Other side effects are most uncommon, but it does make you feel tired. Lots of, lots of people on methotrexate feel fatigue. As a result of the drug, you drop the dose, your fatigue is there. So, you know, it has its, it has its problems, but not terrible for the benefits that you get from it. But it's fair to say that probably only about 30% of people go into complete remission on methotrexate. For 70% of people, while it's a help, not enough. You want to be better than that. And that becomes the hard thing for everybody to make the decision as to how much benefit they hope to get and what they're prepared to, how much they're prepared to sort of venture out into the realm of the unknown to get it. So every time you go into a new drug, it's a bit of an unknown exercise. It's a little bit more unknown if you're in a clinical trial. But you, you better have a bit of faith in the trialist, the person who's conducting it. Because people who conduct trials, and there aren't that many people who are actively involved in doing that, uh, often have an extraordinary understanding of exactly where we're at and can say, well, you know, for this, if the data looks good. Because I know that whenever I'm involved in a trial, there'll usually be a national or, or even at the time an international meeting where all the people involved get together and we have all of the data companies developed about that drug presented and we'll debate that for maybe four or five hours, every little bit, be a document yay thick about all of that data that I will have read before I agree to and there better be some, there better not be any worrying signals of a problem. And there better be some very strong encouragement that's going to work. So I like doing trials late in their development because then somebody else has been the guinea pig. And it's going to be my patients who are probably going to reap the benefit with fairly minimal and at times predictable. You know, at least we know what the side is not. But I mean, there are people here who can give their experience what it's like to be being involved in the trial. Come on, kids. Speak. <laughs> well, I'm not on one now because no. I've got an infection, but I was on um, to still with some for, I was going into my fourth year of trial. It's quite a long trial, still waiting. So, um, yeah, I mean, it didn't really impact a lot of my life. I, I just 
I feel that you know Ben has been a wide summer other than reading the Nimbus, um, sci fi with Stephen, and then go and have the infusion, um, takes a few hours and, and that's it. Um, and I haven't had I can I can't even think of the side effects that I've had from my trial, so yeah. And sometimes we time the trials so that we can then continue people on the drug while it comes on while we wait for it to come onto a subsidized scheme. So Yeah, I was on a trial about five years ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, 2002. Two thousand and two. Um with the infliximab and I didn't worry too much about the impact of the visits, but just the the difference and even the joint count. I think my joint count was 33 on my first day. And I said, this is terrible. I'm having a really good day today. And that was 33. And then I think my last joint count was zero. So the quality of life I've had with very young children has just been miraculous. I would not hesitate to recommend anybody to go on a trial and everybody who joins the group. That's one of my first questions. What drugs are you on? Have you introduced anything new recently? Um, how are you feeling? How about having a second thing and having a discussion about a trial? Because really it just changes your life completely. We do have, uh, dealing, talking to people who, who a younger group, we, we do know that, we do know, that's perhaps a bit strong. We have a lot of suggestive clues to say that if you go on one of these more powerful drugs in the first year or two of your arthritis, it may permanently change the course of the disease. By that I mean you can go on the drug for a year or two and the disease that was showing every sign of being a terribly active, damaging, aggressive disease, even if you stop that drug, it becomes a milder disease thereafter. And at the moment the government regulations do not make it easy for us to get people on this early on. But we know that if you go on these drugs early on, your ability to stay in the workforce dramatically improves. Your ability to function dramatically improves. Your lifetime earnings as a result of being in the, in the, in the workforce dramatically improves. Your ability to be involved in recreational activity improves. The, the amount of damage you get dramatically reduces. I mean, it's a, it's a stunning difference. And, and, but you can achieve that outside the context of the trial. It requires a commitment to aggressive treatment. And have you noticed that you end up in this in this little co-conspiracy with your doctors? Because after a while you get to know them really well. And you come in and say, hi, how are things? Not bad. So how are things with the family? Good. So then you chat about the family for a bit. And after a while you stop examining all the joints every visit. And you respond to what they're saying. And then you have this co-conspiracy where you don't complain too much and they don't inquire too much. So everything's on a needs to know basis. And that's that's a real problem. It isn't really a problem. It's easy to settle into that. No one wants to be stripping off their clothes and popping up on the couch and getting their joints examined every day. It's boring. It's boring, it's intrusive, it's horrid. <coughs> so people have tried to invent ways of developing joint counts, ways of following it, without taking off your socks and shoes, doing it sitting in the chair. And they call it the DAS 28, which means don't touch the feet. <laughs> never touch the feet. And, and so, so you do that. And so that's that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to overcome that co-conspiracy. You, know, you need to be out there saying, I really want to be the best I can possibly be. Is there any way that I can be better? And when I hear my colleagues say, Well, you know, I don't think my patients are bad enough to need these drugs. I'm reminded of what I was taught when I was a medical student by an older, wise physician who said he can tolerate any amount of somebody else's pain. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard call. And so you, you have to say, well, this is what we can do up to this point conventionally. And now we've got to be a little less conventional. You know, there are people who are early adopters and late adopters. You know, there are doctor's offices that still don't have computers. There are people who still don't use the internet. I don't know how you do it and how you interact with your doctors, but a lot of my patients interact with me by email. And most of the time I'm pretty good at replying. Not always, no. Not always. That's shocking. For some people I'm good. You're busy after creating trials.
Yeah, I, know. I, was, I was overseas and I was picking up my email and I'm answering people's questions by email from Copenhagen last week. Mm. And I'm thinking, so not always, but, but you look, a lot of the time you, you'll get onto that. Find the secretary's email address, that's going to be the better one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that there are lots of ways to, to, to do this. But you, you sit and you, you've got to be a bit assertive. You've got to say, I want to be the best I can be. And, and I think that, that Sue's right. I think that the cheapest test in all of medicine is a second opinion. It doesn't mean you're rejecting the first person, but sometimes it's really helpful. I, and when I find I'm not getting very far with my patient, I think I'm really struggling with this one, I'll get one of my colleagues to see them for a second opinion. Because it's, it's a, you know, sometimes it's like going to look at a, a picture and you're standing up really close to the picture trying to look at it and you get a better vision of what's actually going on if you stand back and have a look at it again. So I think getting a second opinion is a really useful thing. Sorry. <laughs> I'm one of those people. Um, I've got Michelle Tellis um, um, very, very confused because she has absolutely no idea what's going on. Because they, um, the, they don't know what's caused the paralysis and so they don't know whether it's caused from the inflammation. But my, um, I'm on Paclinil, but I've had a lot of trouble um, being able to take other medication. Um, I had a reaction to the methotrexate, so I couldn't. I had to stop taking that. Um, and I'm finding it hard because the platform is not holding enough. Because I have RA and osteo, um, and so I'm on very large doses of painkillers, quite strong painkillers, because it's just can't find anything that I can that I will tolerate with my other health problems that um, that I'm sort of have got to a point where I'm not up and down all over the place all the time. You, it's, all of these things, well, you can make sort of generalised statements, all of these things are individually tapered. And we are, each of us, part of the rich tapestry. And each of us has very specific things. And we, each of us, people have problems which preclude them going on a treatment A or B or C, so you can't do it. Like a cookbook. You can say, here are the broad directions. But, but most of the time, if you're going to take the cookbook analogy, most of the time, we're working at the end of the recipe where it says season to taste. Mm-hmm. You know, where you're trying to make it individualised for that particular person. And, and so there are things that you mightn't do for... And people come and say, now, my neighbour sees you, and you've got her on this and this. Why are I on this? <laughs> and, so, you know, and then you've got a real problem, because that you really can't share the other person's medical problems with them. You know, that's not a legitimate thing to do. So, you know, there are differences here. I can do it too. You've got very big differences between the two. Usually, it's you've got different diseases. <laughs> Usually you've got a hell of a different dessert. Like somebody's got a disc problem in their back and the other person's got rheumatoid arthritis, you know. It's a different dessert. Uh, or somebody had a tendon problem in the shoulder, you gave them an injection and the shoulder's never been a problem since. And the other person's got severe muscle inflammation, which makes them profoundly weak. So it's, it's a very different thing. But you're right. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, doctors do get lots of opinions at times and that's usually, usually a helpful thing. What you do know is if you're still stiff in the mornings when you first get out of bed, if you're still stiff when you've been sitting for any length of time and you try and get going, and if you can see swelling around your joints, you're not quite there where we should be able to get you. And that means that whatever is going on, we can't enter into that co-conspiracy we're all comfortable with the situation. Sometimes we do exhaust our options. But all we've done is exhaust the options we've got up to that point. And as new things come available, either in trial or on government subsidy, which usually comes well after the trials, um, then the whole situation needs to be reconsidered. The medication is still going to be really expensive in the future? Or is it more kind of the those biologics of the top? Or will they get cheaper? I think it's cheaper if we can get generic compounds. And the regulations that allow for saying that a generic compound rather than a patented compound. In other words, but what happens is a company gets develops a product and they have patent protection for 17 years with a possible seven-year extension on that. 
Because if companies invested, as they will for a number of these products, up to a billion dollars in its development, they will understand it and say, well, why would we invest that money if we've got no possibility of getting, a ret getting our money back and making a profit? So they need a period of patent protection to encourage that process. But at the end of that time, you'd hope that when it's been around for a while, it should be cheap. Methotrexate's cheap as chips. It's been around a long time. Absolutely dirt cheap. Methotrexate costs the community maybe 40 bucks a year for a person on methotrexate. You have to say that's a bargain. <laughs> that's an absolute bargain. That's 10 cappuccinos <laughs> to keep the person well. I mean, I reckon that's a bargain. <laughs> you can get one for less than four dollars. I don't know. I can stop drinking my coffee and brush. <laughs> but you know, you so you you have all of that, and will it come get the, we? And so what we have with, with the small molecules, it's easy. We've got a whole series of regulations that allow us to say that yes, that's equivalent to what we've got. Now, years ago, 30 years ago, we had a major health crisis because there's digoxin, which is a medication we take for the heart. And there were many different forms of digoxin and there were generic compounds that were being sold that were not the same in their strength and the availability of the body of the one that was sold by the pharmaceutical companies. So people would change from one to another and their levels would go up and down and they became terribly sick and they were admitted to hospital. We had all sorts of problems. So in response to that, Governments around the world developed regulations which allowed them to say that yes, if you can demonstrate this and this and this and this, then we can assume you're equivalent to the compound we've been using. Those regulations have been much more difficult to achieve in these large protein molecules. Because instead of being a little molecule that's like a line, you know, like a series of 10 different pieces lined up on a table, these are enormous molecules and they fold up on themselves like a rubber band that's been twisted tight. And the folds, not only do all the individual components have to be the same, but all the folds have to be the same for it to work the same way. And that's been very difficult to demonstrate. And so that quality control issue has not been satisfactorily addressed with any biological compound after this point. And I don't see any drop in the price unless competition pushes them down, which might or the generic issue is solved. So I think the, the, the great hope for the future is the small molecules. What do you mean by small molecules? They're oral medication? Yes, oral medication. Okay. So not like what, like Mathera or something like you have like two infusions? No, no, that's, even Mathera, which is cheaper, is still about fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars a year. And we need tablets. We need tablets. Mathera is not the bees knees either. Pretty cool. It's not, you know, I don't think it's as good as the team You know, if you compare one to the other. Now, how, how, <laughs> it's an interesting thing, but if you've noticed that no company's ever directly compared one biological to another, yeah. why do you reckon that is? Because they all labeled the same people. No, not different companies. And they'd like to screw each other over. <laughs> I can tell you, they would, they would just be in there rubbing their hands with glee. The reason is because it's insanely expensive to do such a study. And if you invested what would almost certainly be $1 billion to do a study like that satisfactorily, and then you find that your drug was A, no better, B, a little worse, you know, you'll go down the dirt. So no one's going to do that type of exercise where there's not much to gain and a lot to lose. But I am told on the grapevine there may be such a study being done next year. And I, I did speak to some people in San Francisco about, the, about that type of study next year. Because that's what we really need to know. We didn't know, is there really, is, apart from the is there one drug better than another? Is there one drug that's safer than another? Mm -hmm. We're comparing different patient groups. And it's, it's hard. But it's small molecules, I would say, have been the great white art. And the recognition that whatever you say, whatever, when somebody says, well, this is all we've got now, what they mean is that's what we've got on the prescription benefits now. And there might be another six or eight options for you out there. How do you find out about uh, there's a site called clinicaltrials.gov, which is run by the United States, uh, by, and, and every clinical trial that wants to be published in the medical press has to be registered on that site. Mm -hmm. So they all register it because otherwise they can't get published. And if they can't get published, they can't get out there and notice. Mm -hmm. So they're all out there. There'll usually be advertisements around in newspapers on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Or 
You ask your rheumatologist. I mean, your rheumatologist, if your rheumatologist says, oh, I don't know what's being done, then, you know, that's, then you say, well, could you inquire? You know, that's one thing. Or you say, well, can I go and see somebody who is doing them just to talk about? That's one approach. But often they'll inquire. And rheumatologists are a very collegial bunch. You know, we know each other really well. We actually get on extraordinarily well as a group. You know, there are no big frictions within the rheumatology community. Obviously, there are people who you like more than you like other people at a personal level. But, uh, but there are no great frictions there. And people are terribly collegial and supportive. And we have, uh, you know, for our clinical trials, we have our colleagues around town, uh, Michelle, who have referred in uh, patients for consideration of clinical trials. And that, that's not been a big problem at all. Regeneration is a big hot topic. What we need to know is people do cartilage transplants, as you know. Uh, cartilage transplants are very... The problem is that they grow your own cartilage in tissue culture and they give it back to you and it's got the consistency of uh, uh, slush, basically. <coughs> it comes out <coughs> looking like ice that's partially melted. And so it needs to be kept down onto the bone so they have to put a flap of tissue onto it. And that's what they do for athletes. And so it's good for if you've got a divot out of your cartilage that's no bigger than a 20 cent piece. Then it's got a, a role. At the moment, we don't have the technology to know what growth factors those cartilage cells need to make them stick to bone. Stem cells are obviously the great white hope in that regard. We're really hoping that stem cell technology works. The way that stem cells are being done now uh, normally have been to you know, you're familiar with stem cells for bone marrow transplants, where they take the bone marrow from one person and isolate the stem cells and inject them into another person. And many people, will, like myself, will have had their blood taken to be a donor for stem cells. So if somebody has leukemia, they could ring me up and say, look, you're a match with this person, would you be prepared to donate? And I would say yes. It's a, again, a social obligation in that situation. Um, but there are stem cells now that are made which are not blood-forming stem cells, but what are called mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal cells are the origins of things like blood vessels, bone, muscle, cartilage. And those are the stem cells that we'd be looking at. And it turns out that those stem cells, when you inject them, don't cause an immune reaction. You know, the stem cells that you give from bone marrow they can cause this terrible reaction where the stem cells turn on the host and they start causing terrible diseases in the host. These mesenchymal stem cells don't do that. And so that opens the possibility of some commercial growth of mesenchymal stem cells from somebody else, which can then be injected. And the first trials are being done of that in osteoarthritis now. They have not been done in rheumatoid as yet. What you'd want is you'd want the rheumatoid to be beautifully controlled and inactive and then inject the stem cells. Because the likelihood is that the rheumatoid is still very active, that might inactivate the stem cells and kill them. So what you've got to do is turn off the inflammation and then inject the stem cells. Having said that, these mesenchymal stem cells produce lots of anti-inflammatory chemicals. And I'm involved in developing a trial of stem cells for 
looking at the early phase of cartilage at the moment. But watch this space, you know. This is going to be done. It's real early days yet for this stuff. So what is, is the trial for that happening in Australia? This, so that it knows it's for the osteo? For the osteo? Uh, there will be a trial, not for standard osteo. Yes, there will be a trial done in Australia. Early days, but there will be a trial done. But I, I think the whole idea of cartilage regrowth is exciting, uh, but it's really a very much watch this space thing. I, I can't see it being a commercial issue for another five to seven years. But you can be sure that they will fast track this. Mm. And they always will fast track stuff where you've got no good alternatives. Um, like, as a rheumatologist, how do you feel about um, possible causes of rheumatoid arthritis? Um, obviously, it's a debated a lot. You know. Yeah, it has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as, as one of my friends says, in America, he says, in the absence of data, all opinions are equal. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's your opinion on um, a bacterial or viral cause of rheumatoid arthritis? Bacterial, we have never been able to identify bacterial. Get up. Mm -hmm. Am I in love with antibiotic therapy? Because that could be the, the implication of that. And there are people who do intravenous antibiotic therapies and oral antibiotic therapies. Uh, and I'm not a believer. I've not seen any of my patients really do, do particularly well with that. Um, I've used, there was a trial called the MIRA trial, minocycline in rheumatoid arthritis. Yep. Minocycline is an antibiotic that we use for acne. And it was used in high doses in this trial. And it had some very modest benefits with anti-inflammatory, mild anti-inflammatory effect. It does have its potential problems. It causes quite a high rate of liver abnormality. Some people develop a rise in the pressure within their brain, which then threatened the nerves going from the eyes and could cause damage to those nerves in a couple of cases of quite surgery. <coughs> and it causes, it depends. What's your favorite color? Red. Do you like blue? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's because with long-term use of minocycline, blue discoloration of the skin is quite common. <laughs> <laughs> and it can last for years. So blue, you better really like blue. <laughs> <laughs> on my side, it's a good idea to like blue. I'm really curious because I'm undergoing antibiotic therapy and I'm pretty open to a variety of different options. Yeah. Um, and I like to... Sort of I think there's no doubt that minocycline has some benefit. The okay. intravenous stuff, I don't see any data to support the use of intravenously rather than orally. Oh. I think there's zippo data to support that. Oh, I just started that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that, look, the problem when you develop something that's a long-term thing when you're young is that everybody around you tells you, look, you'd be a fool to yourself and a burden to everybody else if you didn't explore all of these things. Yeah. So, and I, I think that one has to work your way through that process. And I guess my expertise lies in the stuff that has been through this type of process, the stuff that I've done. Um, I'm not very convinced by the data, and I've seen no data to suggest that antibiotic therapy will prevent damage or offer the long-term outlook. Yeah. And I think we're playing for very high stakes here. And so, and the problem is it'd be fine if early intervention didn't make a big difference. So you'd say, well, you do it now, or you do it later, it doesn't make any difference, but it does. And so the problem is the problem is that whatever months you're spending doing stuff of questionable benefit is months you could have been spending doing stuff which is really important. Improving. And proven. Yeah. And particularly if, if, the, if the suggestion that these more aggressive treatments permanently alter the course of the disease. Is it possible for someone to go on to... But that would come to be the purpose. If you're undergoing antibiotic therapy and you went on to something that it suppressed your immune system... It would, it would seem to be a little contradictory, wouldn't it? You probably couldn't do it once, so... I think it would be a little questionable to be yep. on an unconventional therapy. And one would have to say that the antibiotics are... We would consider it unconventional. Yeah. The, an unconventional therapy at the same time would be a bit difficult to support. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure, and, and there, are, there are several people around town who have uh, a big interest in antibiotic therapy for the Yeah, um. and they, 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 they're as enthusiastic about what they're talking about as I guess I am about what I'm talking about. True, yeah.
And I think, you know, you work your way through, and if it does great things for you, that's fantastic. And if it doesn't? And if don't try it. If it doesn't, yeah. then you say, okay, done, tick, move on. Which is what I would do. Every, for me, every medication that you use has a timeline. You expect it to work by a certain time. Yeah. Sort of like having a partner who's not performing. <laughs> yeah, so I expect him, her to have improved by this date. And if not, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I just one classic question about Mr. Clegg's age. Yes. Um, I've been diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis for 18 months and mm -hmm. have been on Mr. Clegg's age pretty much that whole time. Um, I was on a dose for 12 months and then I was interested to hear you mention fatigue and those sorts of side effects and, and my specialist has just put me up in my dose recently which seems to have sort of exacerbated things and I'm wondering how do you, how do you judge um, which is which you know, is it, is it the side effects of the drug is it the drug, is it the is drug, it the drug, drug is, is it the arthritis and if, look in general, in general to be honest the only way that you know sometimes whether it's the drug or not is you stop the drug yeah. <clears throat> and you stop the drug and it goes away and then you restart the drug and it comes back uh, you probably don't need to be a boy genius to work out that there is some relationship there. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I would often do. Okay. If you think it's the disease, uh, then and you want to know whether intensification treatment will work, you might sometimes give a very short course of cortisone right. for, say, two weeks, enough to suppress the inflammation and say, well, did suppressing the inflammation translate into dramatic improvement in your condition? And if you say, you know, it didn't really, then you'd say, well, then bumping up the methotrexate is probably not going to do a whole thing. Right. And so you, you get your insights in a number of ways. You're unlikely to get a lot of uh, fatigue from inflammatory arthritis unless you've got a lot of swelling around the joints. Right. So if your swelling's not bad, but you've got a lot of fatigue, then it's unlikely that pushing up the left is going to But if you've got persistent increase in your inflammation markers and some swelling and you've got fatigue, then it can be a tough call tonight. Right. But if you increase your methotrexate and you get more tired, uh, then it's likely that the methotrexate's contributing to that. In which case you might be having to say not that you got put up with it, mm -hmm. but maybe you should be looking at another avenue for treatment because we've certainly got other options. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not on a there's, there's no single pathway to salvation with this one. We've got lots of options. You must be running out of tape by now. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>